Welcome to another episode of Jim's Local Garden. Okay, so as you know, I'd already planted some um, swede in the the garden. Unfortunately, they have come through, um, and then a beetle's come along and basically eaten them off. So what I'm going to do is plant some in these cells, and then um, hopefully they'll sort of catch up in the greenhouse. And um, all being well, I'll be able to plant these out um, in, a, in, a, in a couple of weeks' time when they started to shoot. Now, um, swede are um, brassicas, so basically it's the same seed as you get with most other brassicas, the small sort of black balls. Now what I've done. Like I've done with the other, um, like I've done with the other um, plants in these modules, I've put some compost in, made a little indention um, with my finger in the middle. So basically, what that does is it forms like a little bowl for the seed. So all the seeds roll to the centre of the uh, the cell. Now what I'm doing is putting two or three seeds in each one of these. Um, I'm actually putting three. You don't need much more than that, and that's just a guaranteed germination, really. Now what, obviously, what you'll do is um, as they germinate, just pull out, pull out any of the weaker ones, leaving you with one in each cell. And because obviously you only want one plant in each one. Now these will these will go out as reasonably young plants, hopefully, as soon as they've germinated. So I'll I'll leave these in the greenhouse until they've um, most certainly germinated, um, and then I might put them outside to sort of grow on a little bit. But they can they can stop in here. So that's that's sort of at least three seeds in each one. I'll just put a few more in. I've got out of the packet. Now all I need to do now is is put some more compost on the top. Now the easiest way of doing that is just put the compost on the top like that and just, just sort of push it round with your hand. I like making sure each of the cells is uh, covered like that. That's basically the quickest way of doing it. So now all you need to do is make sure that they're firmed in so basically just go along pushing down. You don't want the soil too firm but you want it reasonably firm. Obviously, these are brassicas, so they, you know they like the ground to be firm. Now I'll water that with some clean tap water. Uh, obviously, label it up with swede, and all being well, in a couple of weeks' time, we'll have some young swede plants that I can put out to replace the ones that have been eaten by the beetles. Okay, so exactly the same way as the. Um the Swedes are going to be growing some chard as well now. I'm going to be putting some out in the row, but I'm frightened that the same beetle is going to have a go um, at these as well. So just to just to make my bets, I'm going to put some in here now. These are from the it's char chard white silver too. Uh, now these seeds um, look like um, little pieces of cork like that. Um, now what I'm going to do is in, in exactly the same way. You know I've got the cells here. I'm just going to put two in each one. Just to make sure I get some germination. Now these are going to go in the greenhouse um, at least for a couple of weeks. Um, and again, what I've done is I've made a made a hole in the middle of each one with my finger, just so that the seeds roll into the middle of the cell, which is where the the best place for them to be. Um, as I say, I'm putting two in each one, and basically what I'll do is I'll just cover these with a little bit of earth. Now, obviously, when I plant these out, they can go slightly deeper than uh, they are here anyway. But uh, this is exactly the same way as I did um, the um, the beetroot, basically, very similar way. So I'm just putting, as I say, putting two seeds in each one. Um, now, because it's already June, what about? Um, well, we're the second week in June now, so I'm most certainly late to do this. Um, but with one thing and another, I just haven't managed to get um, stuff out into the ground. So this will this will most certainly give you um, a head start, if you like. So if you can grow them in these cells, they'll most certainly germinate a lot quicker 
inside um, like this than, um, than they would out in the open ground. So I'm hoping that what I can do is I can bring them on a little bit inside the greenhouse, quickly harden them off and then uh, get them out into the, uh, the ground and then that should bring them on a bit quicker than if I just plant them outside now. So I'm also going to put them outside anyway but um, you know this is just to uh, kind of edge my back a little bit. So all I need to do now is put some um, soil over the top. Um, it's probably going to end up at about half a centimetre or so on top which is um, perhaps a bit less than it would be in the, uh, the open ground. It will most certainly grow um, okay like that. So that's the that's the plants uh, the seeds covered over. Let's get these last few here. Right, so obviously again, just push them down slightly um, like that. Label them up. Now I'm going to water these with some tap water till they've um, germinated. Put a quick label in to say that, that it's charred, and then uh, as I say, I'll be putting some of these out in the um, the open ground in the next couple of days, hopefully, uh, weather permitting. And then I'll, um, but I'll have these going inside so I can always put these in the ground um, should the ones out there get attacked by these beetles. Okay, so I want to catch up on some of the comments and questions that have been coming over in the past sort of month or so, to be honest. I've not done one for a few weeks. So the first one comes from Brian Hubbury, and uh, this goes right the way back to a comment that I was talking about, sort of um, seed companies and that on the internet. And he said he goes to moreveg.com, and he says they've got a really good variety of seeds, so that's one worth looking at. Um, next one comes from Pete's um, Kitchen Garden, and he was saying... Um, the he's found that um, seeds are typically um, a lot more money now than they used to be. Um, and he's also finding that the germination rate is nowhere near as good, so the quality of seed isn't as, is, 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 um, as good. And he was saying basically because he's spending more money on seeds, he's expecting the germination to be you know, really good. But um, unfortunately he's, be, he's saying that's not what he's found, at least in the past few years. Um, next one comes from um, Zalfia. Allison, I think that's I think that's the way you pronounce your um, um, name. Apologies if it, if that's wrong. And um, asking about um, brew kale. Now brew kale is a is yet another um, brassica, and uh, brassicas are all grown in the same way. Basically, the seeds are small, um, dark brown or black, um, sort of small sort of balls, if you like. Um, now brassicas are always easy to germinate. All you need to do is um, put them on a um, scatter them over a, um, a, a seed tray and then you just want to put a you know just sort of I don't know five millimeters of um, fine compost over the top water them don't keep them too wet just keep them moist um, if you find that you're getting bad germination it's typically because you're over watering the seeds uh, so all you need to do is keep them wet um, the one thing you can do is if um, if you're you know, if you're finding that uh, they're a little bit too wet, then then use the bottle sprayers like I was explaining earlier in the year. I'm not quite sure what it is now. Uh, you know, use use one of these because if you use a watering can, uh, you know, you typically you know the amount of water that comes out of a you know the amount of water that comes out of a rose like that is quite a lot. Whereas you know with something like this, you can control it a lot better, and you can just just basically moisten the surface, which is all you need really. Um, as soon as you've done that, the plants will start to grow, and all brassicas are the same when they're small, you know, they all come out with two little leaves, round leaves. And then um, as soon as they sort of get to about sort of two inches high, um, you know, that's the time to prick them out. And now all you, all you need to do is to pull them out with as much root as you possibly can, pot them up into small square um, um, pots like I do, or, you know, round pots will do. But um, I find that square pots are better. And then grow them until the sort of about that high, then you can put them out in the ground. It is advisable that you harden them off, so that's basically take them out of the greenhouse um, and then put, just, just put them outside, leave them in the pots, put them outside and let them get acclimatised to the outside environment if it's, if it's that much different from uh, uh, you know, the inside of your greenhouse. And then as soon as you've done that, all you need to do is then plant them out into the open ground, prepare in the ground, they like, um, they're quite um, sort of robust against um, acidic and lime, so irrigaceous or, 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 or sort of alkali soil. Um, and then, um, you know, they will, they will grow in either. Typically what people do is uh, they lime the ground um, uh, before they put brassicas in. The reason being is when you put in a load of muck and, and you know, an organic material in there, 
uh, what that will tend to do is make the soil slightly acidic, so you know, with a low pH. Um, and when you put the brassicas in, because they're quite, um, you know, sort of robust against, you, you know, whatever the, uh, the acidity is really, within reason, um, if you put lime on the ground, it will then sort of neutralise the ground. But also, um, putting lime on the ground also um, doesn't, doesn't prevent, but it, it, it slows down um, things like um, a, a club root, which is a disease that attacks the roots of all brassicas. Um, so, you know, putting lime on the ground will actually sort of help to, you know, sort of get around that. Um, ground needs to be well dug, fertile, but firm. So, you know, sort of tread on the ground and make sure that it's nice and firm. You don't want it absolutely, you know, hard, but what you want it to do is, is that with all brassicas, the root system isn't, isn't overly strong. So what you want to do is give it enough um, ground and, you, you know, to sort of be able to anchor, anchor itself in the ground. Because uh, when you look at a, you, you know, a lot of brassica plants can get to sort of three or four, five foot, six foot high, in fact. Um, and the you know the root um, the root ball compared to how big the actual plant is is um, not you know not really big enough to support the plant. So what you need to do in in, in a lot of cases like um, like the uh, petrage kale and the um, other other kales and stuff like that um, sprouts and um, things like that you know the plants get that big. Really, what you need to do is to stake them and and sort of tie them up to stop them rocking because when they do rock, that's when the um, you know, you get damage to the stalk like I did earlier this year. Now, um, brew kale is is very much like other um, brassicas. Um, there's a couple of them here which I'm going to be putting out in, in the not too distant future. I've got some more outside there. These have been grown in another greenhouse, uh, which is why you've not seen them before. But basically, what they do is they grow about four foot high, um, and then just like a sprout plant, what you get is up the stalk you get. Um, sort of little um, sort of growths coming out and what it looks like is small kale plants growing out of the side of the stalk um, and these these will grow to something like uh, sort of four foot high uh, dependent on the weather conditions if you keep them well watered not too wet but well watered um, these will grow quite well and you'll and you'll probably get uh, I don't know 20 or 30 little um, sort of florets on the side. Now I only grow a few of these, I've got, I think, I think there's eight of them that I'm going to put in. Um, so you know I don't grow too many of them. But they are a nice vegetable and you do get lots off one plant so you know you don't need too many plants. So what I normally do with them, unlike the kale and things like that where I, where I grow a, a tray of them, all I do is I just have one sort of square pot like that um, and I just put a few seeds in there, grow them and then prick them out from there because you only need a few plants. Um, as I say, these are these are just about ready to go out now, so they're probably about I don't know going on for six inches high. Um, they're, they're typically purple. Uh, there are um, I have I'm pretty sure I've seen another variety which is sort of like a dark green colour, but uh, the purple one is the most common one. Plants in the ground, you will need um, um, some you know some kind of stake. They're not um, a really heavy plant, so like with the brew kale, where I've uh, sorry with the um, petrage kale. What I have done is I've put steel canes in the um, steel stakes in the ground to hold them up. With these, they're not that big, so you know a bamboo cane or a you know just a um, just a branch off a tree or something like that will be more than um, strong enough to um, to plant these. What I suggest you do is put the cane in the ground first, and then plant these up the side of the cane, and then there's no chance of you damaging the roots as you push the uh, the cane into the ground. As soon as you've done that, you need to tie them perhaps in the middle when they get to, I don't know, about 18 inches high, tie them there and then when they get up to sort of three foot again, tie them again. You only need a couple of ties in that. Basically what you're doing is you're protecting the, uh, the base of the plant where it rocks in the ground. Um, as soon as you've uh, tied them in a couple of places, that's more than sufficient. You just need to stop the plants from rocking around in the wind. Um, and that's pretty much all there is to brew kale apart from the fact that, uh, of eating it. When you when you pick it, basically grab the um, the florets will grow out of the side, very much like sprouts do, but obviously the bigger they're about kind of this big. Um, all you need to do is is sort of twist them off, um, just like you would a sprout, um, and then you can either chop those up and um, cook them just just like normal kale, where you you know you kind of shred it and then boil it, or you can leave the um, the uh, the thing as a as a whole structure, and and cook that and then. Um, you know, you can uh, you know sort of put that on the side of the plate as a you know as a whole thing and, and cut it up in half and fork as you eat it. 
Um, the good thing about um, brew kale is you don't have to eat it all at the same time. It's like other kales. What you can do is just pick a few leaves and the plant will carry on growing. Um, obviously pick the larger leaves from the, uh, from the bottom and let the smaller leaf or the growing head um, grow. Don't pick the growing head because that's the part where the, you know, the plant will continue to grow. So just pull the leaves from the side, start it from the bottom, work your way up. And um, you know the, the lower florets will form first, so take those off first and then you know, as the plant grows you can, you can continue up the stalk. So that's kind of brew kale. Um, apart from that, um, there's, 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 there's not really much to know. The only um, things that will attack them are um, obviously you can get um, aphids attacking them if, if they're really bad. Um, the other thing that you need to look out for are cabbage whites, which are the white butterfly with, 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 with black spots on. Um, they will um, lay their eggs under the leaves and they'll turn into caterpillars and the caterpillar will eat the plant. Um, so you need to look out for those. If you've not got yours in a, um, a cage, those are the um, really the only pests. Apart from pigeons, pigeons will, will take all the leaves off and eat them um, but uh, but yeah that's that's really the only predators for the uh, predators as such you know you, you know animals or creatures that will sort of damage the uh, the the, uh, the brassicas but they're all the same um, you know the you know pretty much all the brassicas will be attacked by those things okay so the next comment comes from Slash and he's talking about courgette he's put 10 seeds in he's only got three plants out of the um, out of the seeds that he's put in this is typically down to assuming that the seeds are good um, this is typically down to um, overwatering. Um, now, with the weather getting hot, cold, hot, cold, it, it's a really difficult balance. To be honest with you, what you need to be doing is 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 only water them a little bit. Always plant the seed around an inch to an inch and a half down into the soil, and then just keep it moist. You don't need too much water. Um, you know, don't try and water with the rose water, as I said before. You know, with one of these bottles, and then you can control the water a lot better. Um, always plant the seed in the middle of the middle of the uh, the pot and then just water the middle of the pot and then that should control the water so if you have got poor germination it's, it's probably down to one or two things either you've had a cold snap um, and the uh, the temperatures dropped and uh, that's that's you, you know caused problems with the germination or more more likely is you've over watered it and it's rather than um, having enough water to you know to grow it's actually sat in water and that's you know that's caused problems with the germination so more likely than not assuming that your seeds okay and your compost is okay um, it's it's going to be over watering I think is probably the uh, the cause of it so with with um, the gourds never over water them you know it is easy to over water them as soon as the plant gets going you know it's out and it's got its leaves and stuff like that obviously it's going to be performing um, photosynthesis and it's going to be drawing water out of the ground but obviously when it's a seed um, it's not going to be taking that much water out. So until you actually see it, um, you know, sort of coming out, and, uh, you, you know, putting out its seed leaves, you only need to keep it just moist. That's all you need. Um, the next one comes from uh, Milo's Coffee, and he was saying, um, "What are you going to do with all of the uh, acolo? Um, are you going to eat the foliage?" Um, to be honest with you, with the acolo, I am, I am going to largely, um, I will try the foliage, and this is the first time I've grown it this year, I will try the foliage, but predominantly what I want is the uh, the tubers in the ground. So uh, what I'm going to do is um, pretty much leave it to it. I will try the leaves at some point, you know, as soon as the plants get established. But what I want to do is leave them, let them get really established, and then, um, you know, because I'm, I'm, I'm largely focusing on getting the, uh, the tubers off them at the end of the year. But um, I will try the leaves at some point in a salad or whatever. Um, but that's um, that's that's sort of pretty much what I'm going to do. Next year I plan to grow a little bit more, so I'm going to save the um, some of the tubers for next year, um, and um, you know you know sort of try them towards the back of the year. With the acolo, I think they're exactly the same as things like the the, the ochre and the, the the mashu. What you want to do is let them grow till it frosts, and then and then the uh, the tops will die back. That's when the uh, the rhizomes or the or the or the tubers will form properly. And that's when you can start to dig them out of the ground. So um, I'm looking forward to the end of the year where I can actually try those. Um, the next one comes from um, Sandy Moth, and she was talking about the uh, the bubble the bubble wrap that you put around green houses and stuff like that. And she's saying which way around to put it. There's no right and wrong way, basically. Um, I've always put it so the bubbles are facing the um, the glass. The reason being for that um, is is twofold. One. You, um, <clears throat> if you put it the other way around, if you imagine there's the the gaps between the bubbles, um, you're only going to have a small thermal sort of gap. I mean, basically, to put it around, what you're actually doing is you're 
creating a larger thermal barrier, thermal barrier between the inside of the greenhouse and the outside. Obviously, the glass is a reasonably good conductor, so the cold from outside will, you know, will most certainly draw the heat from the inside. So, what you're actually doing by putting bubble wrap in is is you're um, slowing down the process of the thermal um, energy, you know, sort of going through the glass. So, the more of a gap that you've got between the um, the glass and the uh, the plastic, the better, um, because you know the the larger the distance, the uh, the bigger the thermal resistance, if you like. Now, I've always turned the bubbles that way, so that um, I've always, um, you know, got you know sort of got a minimum of of, of kind of an inch of of um, plastic barrier between the uh, the plants and the uh, and the inside face of the glass. Um, so that's the way I've always done it. I think you could do it either way. Uh, the second reason why I do it is um, obviously any any sort of um, disease or problems that your plants may get on the inside of the greenhouse will then only be on the flat surface so that's easier to wipe down and clean you know you can get some jace fluid or some um, some um, you know some bleach or whatever and you can wipe the plastic down which is the face which has been um, facing the plant if it was the other way around where you've got all the bubbles you've got all of the, the you know the contours around the bubbles and stuff so it's going to be a lot more harder to um, a lot harder to um, sort of clean and uh, you know and, and sort of destroy any bacteria or fungi that's on there. So that's kind of why I've always put the plastic on, so the bubbles face the glass, and the flat side of it always faces the plant. As I say, there's no right and way wrong, uh, right and wrong way of doing it, but that's the way I've always done it um, for those reasons. Uh, the next one comes from uh, Brian Upper again, and he was saying. Um, um, that he uses plastic bottles when he uh, when he plants his runner beans. What he does is he puts plastic bottles over the plant uh, or over the seed. So basically, he puts it down the cane, and then um, what he can do then is put um, some slug pallets inside the um, inside the bottle, um, and he can water around that, um, and he can um, you know sort of water the plant, but. The uh, the slug pallets stay um, okay on the inside, so that's a that's a trick that he's been using. Um, I've got uh, another two comments now: one from Brian and one from Fifty Shades of Green, and I've put a colour. Um, um, basically, they were asking uh, sort of where they're from and, and, and what it's all about. Um, just excuse me, I'm just moving the other uh, thing over. So. Basically, a colo comes from the the Andes, so it's it's you know kind of South America. That's the that's the uh, uh, the area of, of of where they're grown. Basically, don't grow too many potatoes over there. So these are the the staple um, sort of source of um, starch. Um, obviously, you know we've got various crops in the world. Uh, you know, sort of potato, rice, uh, wheat. They're all sources of starch or sugar uh, that you know that we have in our diet. And um, a, um, Oloco is the um, is the plant that will grow um, best out there. So that so they grow it as a um, you know sort of vegetable like we have potatoes or, or, or rice or whatever. And um, it's it's the most it's the economical uh, um, most important root crop that's grown in South um, America. Obviously, you know everybody eats it and they also export it as well. So uh, you know obviously it grows really well in their uh, you know in their growing conditions in the you know the sort of the, you know, sort of the middle of the earth to the south of Kuwait, you know, that kind of area there. Um, you know, that's where they grow it, uh, mainly that's where it's from. And so, obviously, you know, it, it's important to them. I'm growing it from a, you know, from an interest point of view. Obviously, it will grow in the northern hemisphere as well, in the UK and that. Um, but um, obviously, the plant isn't resistant to frost. Um, so obviously you need to set the tubers inside, you know, and keep them frost free, otherwise they'll get damaged. But uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's basically all about the colour. Um, it's becoming more and more popular in the UK, I think. Uh, most certainly I've seen a, um, you, you know, a, an increased interest in it over the past few years, whilst, you, you know, well, I hadn't really heard of it, um, you know, a few years ago, but uh, the seemingly it's quite a few people growing it now. Uh, next one comes from um, um, Slash, and he was saying, why, <clears throat> when I was putting out the, um, the the pumpkins and the squashes and the, the cuttle jets and that, he said, why didn't you just concentrate the grass around the, um, the the, the gourd plants rather than just spreading it everywhere and digging it all in. The reason being is that that far corner. I don't know if you remember back sort of last year and the year before. That that far corner of the uh, the allotments, the the soils most certainly the 
the worst soil on the plot. It's, it's quite heavy. There's a reasonable amount of not 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 clay, but the water tends to sort of go, you know, to the, you know, go to that far corner. I've got drainage systems now, actually, which take it out. But the soil there um, needs some organic material in it to break it up and stuff like that. So um, obviously, I need the grass in there for the um, the courgettes and the um, pumpkin plant and stuff like that. But at the same time, what I'm doing over the next few years is putting lots and lots and lots of um, stuff in there to you know to break up the soil. Last year I put loads of wood chip in that in that area and I dug all that in and all of the um, a lot of um, chicken muck and straw and stuff like that also got dug into that bottom corner. Um, this year I'm putting more nitrogen rich um, so the grass and stuff like that in there uh, which will which will break down all the stuff that went in there last year to make sure that I've got lots of organic carbon material um, in that far corner and that should improve the soil. So. Um, I need the grass for the um, the gourds, but also at the same time, uh, the reason why I put so much of it down there and dug it all in is I'm trying to improve the soil long term in that in, in that back corner. Um, next um, next question comes from Jacqueline um, Bramble, and she was asking about the when I did the field tour, um, I was showing various cages which are which are dotted all around here. Now um, she was saying, where do the what are these? What are these cages, and where you know where can you possibly get them? These are the cages that the um, that uh, that are dotted all around the UK, really, and uh, they're used in um, embankment. Um, so where you've got roadworks and stuff like that, where they're building an embankment to put a road through um, uh, the hill or whatever. Um, what they do is they use these cages and they fill them full of large rocks to hold back the um, the embankment. Um, so they're, I don't think they're sort of readily available to buy. Um, we were we were quite lucky that um, a gentleman managed to get some, um, who actually worked for um, the uh, the road building industry, and um, he managed to get a, a sort of lorry load of them. So that's why they're all over the place. Most people here have got them, um, and but but you can make your own. So the uh, the one thing I would suggest is if you can't get them. Um, if you buy um, Harris fence panels like I did to build the tunnel, uh, what you end up with after doing all of that is, is, the, is the wire mesh. It's exactly the same stuff as they're made out of. So if you get the, uh, the wire mesh, you can cut out um, you know, a top, two sides and two ends. And, um, and all the are is just sort of clipped together so you can just use cable ties or whatever. And so you can very quickly make your own um, version of those to whatever size you want really. Um, you can buy metal um, um, mesh um, to, you know, to make them from, but it's reasonably expensive. So what I would suggest you do um, is if you have got some wire cutters, which is all you need really, um, is uh, get yourself a couple of old um, Harris fence panels. You can buy the um, panel, take off the mesh, and then uh, you know you can make the boxes from there. I've not seen that. I've not had a look on the internet um, to see if you can actually buy those um, those boxes, but. Um, I would imagine if you go to a sort of reasonably large landscaping type company, they should be able to get those. But um, but yeah, that's that's basically what I would do. If I wanted to make some of those, what I would do is I'd get some Harris fence panels, I'd take off the the grill and use the grill to make make some of those up. Next one comes from a lot with some cycling. Um, uh, Tina and Jason, and they were saying um, about the sweet peas. It was it was in response to the sweet pea. Um, clip that I put out me putting the sweet peas out and uh, they were saying do you pinch the sweet peas uh, so basically what what you can do is get a sweet pea plant and you can pinch out the top and what that will do is encourage the plant to sort of bush out and, and, and sort of grow my sweet peas are a little bit behind others this year to be honest with you but amongst other things they are reasonably slow so um, I've, I'm not going to bother pinching them out because when you when you pinch it it, it, um, it encourages it to sprout but it also slows it down um, so I shan't be doing that this year. I have done it in the past and it does encourage them to bush. It's something my father always does, he always takes out the tops and gets them to bush up a bit. Um, but if you want um, if you want lots of flowers, um, pinching them out will, will encourage more branches which will give you more flowers. Um, but um, if you leave them to grow obviously they will grow a lot taller and you, you know and you'll get more of a wall there. As you know I've put that mesh down the side there. I want them to get all the way to the top of that so that's why I've not pinched mine out. But it is something you can do. And what it'll actually do is make more of a bushy plant and it will um, give you more flowers potentially and a, and a, and a, and a better structure to the plant. But uh, if you're growing it up wire like I'm doing, um, you know, a lot of the 
um, you know, people who do grow sweet peas, you know, and that's their thing, uh, they won't typically pinch them out because what you because by by pinching them out, you will get more flowers, but the flowers won't be as big. So uh, you know, if you want fewer larger flowers, um, don't pinch them out. If you want a lot more um, smaller flowers, then pinch them out, and that's what you'll get. So that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid, today. So please don't hesitate to put any comments or questions you've got below, and I'll always get back to you. And I'll see you on the next episode of Jim's Love and Garden.